There are certain activities that are naturally part of the Christian life. They are the things that flow from the new nature given to the Christian by the Holy Spirit. Praying to God, which is the way in which we speak and share with God our thoughts and desires, hopes and fears. It is also the way in which we can thank Him and praise Him for all He has done for us. Studying the Bible, which is the way God speaks to us and shows us who He is and how to obey His will. Gathering with other believers to build each other up in the faith, to love and care for each other as true brothers and sisters in the Lord. Corporate worship of God that includes the hearing of God's word in song and sermon. All these things are part of the healthy Christian life. But God has given two specific ways in which we see the gospel which saves us. Because we are physical creatures that can taste and smell and touch, God has given us two tangible ways to keep on believing and keep on trusting Him with our lives, even in the midst of doubt and fear. These two ways of seeing the gospel are called sacraments, which are visible ways of God showing us His grace to us. Simply put, they are spiritual road signs or road maps to show us the forgiveness of sins we have in Jesus Christ and to encourage fellowship with God through Christ as beloved sons and daughters. Now, the first sacrament is baptism. Baptism is the application of water on a believer in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is a one-time sign and seal of entering into the Christian life. The Bible in many places commands the baptism of new believers. Jesus does this in Matthew 28. He tells his disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A couple places in Acts, uh, Peter says, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And in Acts 22, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Now, there are two reasons for this emphasis on baptism for those who believe and repent. The first one is this. It's like receiving a diploma upon graduation from college. The diploma is a visible and public sign that a person has completed a course of study and is now able to enjoy the benefits that come with that degree, i.e. becoming a doctor or a lawyer or an architect or an engineer. Being baptized is a visible and public sign that a person has received Christ, has been buried and raised with Him, and now receives all His benefits because of their union with Him. The second reason is that just like a degree has the sign of a school on it that attests to its authenticity, Baptism also is the seal which guarantees that the believer is counted among those who have been saved because of what the sign signifies. Keep in mind, however, that the degree itself is not the hundreds and hundreds of hours of study or the proven knowledge that earned the degree. It's only the symbol of it. It is the same with baptism. It is the outward symbol that points to the inward reality of faith and forgiveness of sins that is already present in the believer. The things that baptism points to are the washing away of our sins and the reception of our new nature. Now let's look at these aspects one at a time. Now, baptism points to the reality of two kinds of washings, you might say. We are made spiritually clean by the washing of the blood of Christ. Just as the use of water will rinse dirt off our physical bodies, so too the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross washes the filth of unrighteousness from us and makes us clean and pure in God's sight. It is Christ who loves us and washed us from our sins by his own blood, Revelation 1.5. But there's another kind of washing, and, and that is that we are made new by the washing of the Spirit of God. In baptism, we died with Christ to the old sinful way of living and are raised to new life with him in the power of his resurrection. In Titus 3.5, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, when a person comes to faith and is baptized, the things signified in the baptism point to the inward reality of what has actually happened to that person. Now, let me say in the strongest way that although every Christian is commanded to be baptized, this does not mean that one cannot be saved without it. It's just that any new Christian will want to be baptized as a sign of what God has accomplished in them and as a way to publicly proclaim their faith in Christ. Now, if you've been baptized as an infant and have come to a saving knowledge of Christ as an adult, there is no additional baptism needed. Simply look back to the day when, as a little helpless baby, water was placed on you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a sign of the forgiveness of sins and realize that what that baptism pointed to way back then has finally taken full effect. Know also that God had his loving hand on you even when you were a tiny, little, helpless infant. Now, the second way that God keeps our faith alive is through the common earthly elements of bread and wine. This sacrament, which was instituted by the Lord on the night that he was arrested and subsequently put to death, was also the very last night that the Old Testament celebration of the Passover meal was to be celebrated. Remember that the Passover meal was a commemoration of when God saved his enslaved people in Egypt from the angel of death by commanding them to place the blood of a lamb over the top of their doorway. This Old Testament sacrament was about to become obsolete. When Jesus and his disciples had finished the Passover meal, he took the bread that was at the table and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After passing the bread around the table, he then raised a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus was displaying with these common elements what it was that he was about to accomplish. He was to be the final and ultimate Passover lamb. The Bible tells us to do this often as we walk through the world as Christians. In 1 Corinthians 11, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, in baptism, we have a one-time act of being introduced to the journey of the Christian life, having been washed as an outward sign to show the inward reality of forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ. In the Lord's Supper, we are given a continual strength, you might say, and nourishment for the journey. We are to come together in a worshipful setting as believers and allow the Lord Jesus to nourish our hungry souls with himself. The supper shows us that as sure as we feel the bread with our hands and taste the wine with our mouths, so sure are the benefits of Christ and his death given to us by faith in him. The supper reminds us that God loves us no matter what is happening in our lives or the current mess we have gotten ourselves into. It's not happening because God is angry with us. In the supper, Jesus Christ is present with believers in a spiritual way through the Holy Spirit. Now, when eaten normally, bread and wine nourish the physical body and strengthen it. But when these common elements are used in this special way, they become visible gospel that truly nourishes and strengthens our souls. Along with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the supper is another way of Jesus Christ making good on his promise, which we find in John chapter 14. He said, I pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And Jesus Christ does not leave us as orphans. He's given us 
the, the guarantee of salvation and ultimate glorification with him through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and he comes to us also in the Lord's Supper.